in this video we are basically going to be looking at um, what is known as incohate offenses we'll also be looking at strict liability offenses and then we'll also be looking at the doctrine of vicarious liability however what we're going to do we are going to look at these criminal law principles in terms of a question so uh, we are going to analyze this question in detail because many of the times criminal law uh, questions can really be very technical very complicated and in case you do not have a proper in interpretation of such a question you can always misfire so we are going to go through a question and i'll also be teaching you how you can actually approach and critically analyze a criminal law question in case it is set and how you can actually properly write an essay to answer such a question hello there my name is Mutiaba conrad i'm a lawyer and a private law tutor and before we start on our class i encourage you to ensure that you subscribe to my channel please click the subscription button also turn on your notification this will really be very helpful to you as whenever i release videos this will always be brought to your attention and you'll not miss out and in case you find this video interesting just give it a thumbs up just like it and also share it with your colleagues so that they are also able to benefit finally for students who are interested in private law tutorial sessions please feel free to contact us our numbers are down in the description box these private law tutorial sessions really help and students who have this sort of mentorship from the experts have continuously been proven to outperform their colleagues who do not have any sort of mentorship and most of our students who are on the program have always emerged top of their class and therefore we encourage you to always contact us in case you're struggling in school or you need any professional help so let's start right away with what we are going to be looking at in this video uh, I promise that we are going to look at a question as we are looking at um, uh, incohate offenses, uh, strict liability and vicarious liability principles. So we are going to look at it in form of a question and I'll also be teaching you how to actually interpret this question. So the question for the day is basically, uh, it states as follows, that the heart of criminal law, the Latin maxim, actus non facit rium, nisim and citria, is a general rule to which incoherent offenses are no exceptions discuss so you're required to actually discuss this question now it's very important to note that you will not be able to effectively answer this question unless you have actually um, had a very good understanding of what incoherent offenses are uh, vicarious liability and also the principle of strict uh, liability and the offenses they are under so before we actually bisect this question, I'll, I'm briefly going to take you through the key terms to understand in detail if you're going to effectively understand uh, or rather answer this question very well. So the key terms to understand that are important in this uh, question first is uh, what does the term actus non facit rium, nisim and citria actually mean? So you have to understand what that Latin maxim means for you to be able to answer this question so basically this latin maxim means the act is not culpable unless the mind is guilty so in essence what this mean means is that um, a person cannot be found criminal liable criminally liable okay for acts committed if actually their mind is innocent so meaning in essence that for someone to be said to commit an offense they are both must be the actus reus, which means a guilty act, and the mens rea, which actually means a guilty mind. Please look up, there is already a class on my channel that in detail discusses actus reus and mens rea. Please look it up, it's on my channel after this video. Let's now proceed to look at another key term in the question that is important for you to know. That is incoherent offenses. Now, you need to understand what incoherent offenses are about and what they are. If you don't have a good understanding of these offenses, you'll not be able to comprehend and properly understand this question. But briefly, I'll take you through them. And basically, an incoherent offense or offenses, it is a step towards the commission of another crime. The step itself being serious enough to merit punishment. So incoherent offenses, in summary, um, basically it is a crime of preparing or seeking to 
commit another crime. Okay? So basically that is what incoherent offenses are about. Most of the times for incoherent offenses, you're taking a step or the accused person is taking a step or a criminal is taking a step towards the commission of another crime. They are doing something. There is a certain course of action they are taking and they are preparing to commit another crime. Okay? The step that they are taking in itself being serious enough to merit punishment, the preparation, the steps that they are taking are enough for such a type of criminal to actually be punished. Now, you also have to understand that authority for that position can be found under the Black Laws Dictionary, 9th edition by Brian A. Garner, and I encourage you to look at page 1186 for the definition of incoherent offenses and to also have a better understanding of what they are. Let's now proceed to look at the three uh, incoherent offenses. Now, you need to understand that these um, incoherent offenses are actually divided into three various types. The first is what we call attempt offenses. Now, with attempt offenses, these are basically offenses where the accused person is attempting to commit a crime. We'll be looking at them a little bit more in detail when we are uh, looking at the question. Uh, approach. But however, it's important to note at this stage examples of such attempt offenses, such as attempted murder, okay, attempted rape, among others. So these attempt offenses is simply one class of incoherent offenses. The second um, type of incoherent offenses is what we call conspiracy offenses. Now with conspiracy offenses, basically here what is happening is uh, the accused person is conspiring to commit a certain offense. So there is conspiracy, okay? People are planning. There could be two accused persons. They are conspiring to commit an offense, okay? Conspiracy offenses. The third type is what we call solicitation offenses. Now, with solicitation offenses, here there is one party who is soliciting another to actually commit a crime. So those are what we call solicitation offenses. Now, all these three types of categories fall under incoherent offenses and they are all actually provided for under the law. Now let's proceed to look at the elements of each of these three. So the elements of attempts or offenses pertaining to attempts include the following. So you'll find that most of these offenses pertaining to attempts require these three to be part of the elements. One, specific intent. So for attempt offenses there must be specific intent. Secondly, overt acts towards commission. There must be an overt act. An overt act in summary is basically an act that is very close to the act. Okay? That is an overt act. Secondly, failure to consummate the offense. So for attempts, there must have been a failure. Okay? Because you see, if we are going to charge you for attempted murder, okay, and find you guilty, you must have attempted to kill someone. Okay? And in your attempt, the reason why you are calling it attempted, it's because you failed. You attempted, but you failed. That's why we are saying that there must be a failure to consummate the offense. Because if there is no failure, that means we would not be charging you for attempted murder. Instead, we would be charging you for murder. That's why we are saying that as one of the elements of these uh, attempt offenses, there must be a failure to consummate the offense. There must have been a failure to actually execute the purported offense. Let's now proceed to look at the elements of conspiracy or offenses of a conspiracy nature. The first element is what, again, is known as specific intent. So again, you see this is coming up. And the specific intent is actually the mens rea. Okay, whenever you see an intent, okay, that means um, it's one of the elements of mens rea. Secondly, proof of agreement. So for conspiracy offenses, there must be some sort of proof of agreement between the parties or the accused persons, okay? Uh, and that is actually the actus reus of conspiracy offenses. Now, this can be proved by any of the following two types. So you can prove, you can always prove agreement between the parties by any of the following two ways. One, by what we call chain uh, conspiracy. So chain conspiracy, basically, this is where two people are working together in a sort of a chain. Okay. For example, if it is a um, su supply of drugs, illegal drugs, okay, such as cocaine or anything of the sort, there is a person who is producing it, he's giving it to a supplier, 
The supplier is selling it to a wholesaler. There is a wholesaler who is selling it to a retailer. A retainer. So there is basically that chain. So whenever you're able to show that there is a conspiracy chain, then you are in essence proving an agreement between parties. Okay. Secondly, um, proof of agreement can also be through what we call the will conspiracy. Will conspiracy. That is W H W E L. Okay, will conspiracy. Now, with will conspiracy, basically here what we are talking about is here there is actually a chain, but there is a certain level. Okay, there are people producing. Again, let's use the example of a drug. There are people producing a drug, but these people are supplying it to middlemen, and these middlemen are transacting with minimal contact to the bosses. Okay, and they are actually protecting the bosses. From being part, yet the bosses are actually benefiting from the whole chain. So if there, if it's like a drug, there is a, there is a, the middle people dealing in it, the mafias, but they are working for, let's say, the bosses, okay, who they are actually protecting, and they'll never reveal them. Now, normally for for will conspiracy, for you to be able to 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 to, to establish this agreement, normally what police does, it sends spies to go and enter into that chain so that you're able to connect okay but basically that is what will conspiracy is about let's now proceed to look at the elements of solicitation offenses now uh with solicitation offenses first of all you need to know what they are solicitation offenses these are offenses where uh, a party is actually soliciting another to commit an offense they are enticing another person they are encouraging them to commit an offense they are inducing another party to commit an offense. That's why they are known as solicitation offenses. Now, the elements of these solicitation offenses include the following. One, words that contain inducement, and that is actually the actus reus of those offenses. Secondly, specific intent, okay, to persuade someone else to commit a crime, and that is actually the mens rea. Now, it's important to know uh, the example of such an offense. And one of the examples of such an offense, or uh, such as a solicitation offense, is inducing soldiers or policemen to desert. That is actually provided for under Section 30 of the Penal Code Act, Cap 120. So when you look it up, that is an example of uh, a solicitation uh, offense. So that is it basically about uh, solicitation, conspiracy, and attempt offenses. We say that all these are examples of what we call incoherent offenses. Now, having understood that background of what actually those uh, incoherent offenses are, let's now proceed to have a proper interrogation of the question, to understand what it actually means. The question is saying that the heart of criminal law, the heart of criminal law, the Latin maxim, actus non facit rium, nisi men sit rea, is a general rule to which incoherent offenses are no exception. You're required as a student to proceed and discuss that question. Now, simple words such as discuss can often confuse students. To discuss basically is to give a critical understanding of what a certain statement or something means. This discussion must be a double-sided discussion. That is looking at the important aspects of the question in material detail. Okay, So there must be that aspect of critical analysis, looking at both sides, looking at a certain principle in material detail. Okay, So basically that is what discussion means. Let's now proceed to look at the answering structure of this question. How, how would you be required to answer this question? What would be your structure? One, you must have an introduction. Okay, so introduce the question. The second um, uh, structure when you're answering the question is having a body. Your answer should have a body. Number three, make sure you have a conclusion. That is basically the structure. Let's now proceed to look at um, uh, this structure in detail. In your introduction, what must you include? Number one, in your introduction, make sure that one, you define a crime. The examiner wants to know, do you know the basic principles of criminal law? Before you even go into the gist of the question, do you understand what a crime is? So please briefly define a crime. Number two, look at the elements of a crime. 
in your introduction, talk about the elements of the crime. And these include actus rea and mens rea. Please, on my channel, I already have a well-detailed structured class on the elements of a crime. Look it up and after this video and first have a good understanding of what actus rea and mens rea is actually about. Number three in your introduction, also talk about the elements of actus rea and mens rea. Very briefly, talk about this very briefly, relating them to the elements of a crime, okay? Now, again, there is already a class on my channel, please, after this video, uh, just go onto my playlist, uh, go into my videos and look for uh, uh, a class on the elements of actus rea and mens rea. It's very important for you to understand them before you actually attempt this question, because uh, my class really explains uh, those aspects uh, very well in detail. Now, also, it's important to note uh, actus reus, as we said already in that video, if you look it up, this is basically uh, voluntary acts and causation. And then the mens rea, this uh, is indicated through aspects such as intention, recklessness, knowledge, among others. Okay. Now, in your introduction, also proceed number four, to state the general rule. This is very important. State the general rule that is at the heart of criminal law. Okay. What is that? Because the question is telling you that that maxim is the heart of criminal law. Okay. So go on to state the general rule. What is the general rule? Okay. And the general rule is as follows. There is no criminal liability for acts or omissions devoid of mental fault. That is the general rule. Okay. That is the general rule. <clears throat> now, what basically this general rule means, in summary, is that the actus reus and mens rea must be present for one to be criminally liable. So a person cannot be found criminally liable if actus reus or mens rea is missing. If any of those two elements is missing, then a person cannot be said to have committed a crime. That is basically what the general rule I just stated is about. Okay? So you have to state that general rule because that general rule is in line with the maxim that actus non facit rim, nisi men sit rea. Okay? Now, after stating that general rule, proceed now to the body of the question. And while you're discussing the body of the question, what must you include in the body? One, show how the maxim actus non facit rim Nisim and sit rear is the heart of criminal law. In your body, you should be able to show this in detail and show it authoritatively. Refer to case law, refer to sections of the act, refer to the constitution. This will be able to earn you very high marks. So this is really very important. So that's what you should be able to show in your body. Now, how do you show this? You show this by showing how the maxim or the general rule is an integral part. You have to show how it's an integral part, how it is part, how it is uh, part of our criminal justice system or our criminal laws. For example, okay, this is, uh, I'm proceeding to give you how, some of the examples of how you will show that. One, in your body, uh, look at the definition of an offense. Start with, with basics, such as the definition of an offense. When you look at section two of the Penal Code Act Cap 120, it defines what? Um, an offense is. And it defines an offense as an act or attempt. Please note these words. It's either an act or attempt punishable by law. Okay? Remember we say that attempts are an example of incoherent offenses. Okay? And an offense is defined under the penal code as an act. Meaning that there cannot be an offense committed unless there is an act. An act in itself refers to the actus reus, a guilty act. So meaning that even the criminal justice system, by just way of defining an offense, actually in itself is recognizing the, the, the doctrine or the maxim. That is one, okay? Secondly, the general offenses, okay, require both mens rea and actus rea. When you look at general offenses, okay, for example, murder. They, you cannot be convicted successfully for murder. You can't be found guilty unless prosecution is able to prove actus reus and mens rea. And please, you must show the examiner 
that you are also aware of the standard of proof in criminal matters. And the standard of proof in criminal matters required of prosecution is beyond reasonable doubt. Okay? And the burden is always on prosecution. It's very important for you to incorporate these elements in your essay. Show the examiner that you know the burden, that the burden is on prosecution to prove its case on a standard beyond reasonable doubt. Find some authorities to back up those principles that I'm sharing for you, with you. There are so many authorities on standard and burden of proof. Look at Wilmington versus DPP and so on and so forth. There are so many cases. Now, as you're doing that, you're actually showing the examiner that incoherent offenses are at the heart of the criminal law uh, system, or they are part and they are they are part and partial of the heart of criminal law. By showing him that actually when you look at some offenses, you can't have a conviction unless you are able to prove actus rea and mens rea. Some of the offenses you can look at, we already talked of murder, contrary to section 188 of the Penal Code Act. Look at the elements, for example, of murder. One of the elements that you have to prove for a successful conviction of murder, one, you have to prove death of a person, and the death in itself, proving death, is actually the actus reus of murder. Secondly, malice aforethought. You have to prove malice aforethought. Malice aforethought is the mens rea of murder. Okay? Secondly, look at an offense such as rape. Contrary to section 123 of the Penal Code Act, Cap 120, one of the elements is what we call canon knowledge. For you to, to get a successful conviction as prosecution, you must prove canon knowledge. Canon knowledge is the actus reus of rape. Secondly, absence of consent is one of the elements of rape. You have to show that the, 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 the lady or the man who was raped did not consent. And consent is, an, it points to the aspect of a mens rea. So that is already showing you, okay, that some or uh, most of the offenses actually require both actus reus and mens rea. And therefore, that maxim is at the heart of a criminal law in Uganda. Now, after showing that, okay, turn then to incoherent offenses, okay? Turn to incoherent offenses and show them as well that actually even incoherent offenses are no exception, okay, to, uh, to, to that maxim. That even with incoherent offenses, you still need to have both actus reus and mens rea. Now, when you turn to incoherent offenses, first start by defining what incoherent offenses uh, and, and, and their categories are. I already took you through that in the beginning. I'll not take you through it again. Secondly, show how the maxim is the heart of those incoherent offenses. Okay? That is what, the, by doing so, you would be marrying your answers with a question. You would be answering the question by showing how these incoherent offenses are actually um, part of the maxim, okay? Let me give you an example. Some of the answers that you will be looking at. For example, one, for solicitation offenses, okay? The offense, this, as we said, uh, for example, one offense of solicitation is the offense of inducing soldiers or policemen to desert, okay? Contrary to Section 3 of the Penal Code Act. Now, when you look at that offense, okay, Persuading to desert is actually the mens rea. Then the words that you use, okay, whether written or oral, never mind, it doesn't matter, but provided you used words to persuade uh, soldiers or a policeman to desert um, and you induced them, that is actually the actus reus of the offense. So again, we are seeing that even for incoherent offenses, you still need to prove actus reus and mens rea. And this goes to show you how the maxim as stated in the question, is actually the heart of criminal law. That a person cannot be made criminal liable unless there is both actus reus and mens rea. Let's proceed to look now at attempts or attempt offenses. And I'm going to give you an example of one. For example, attempted murder. Attempted murder is an example of an, att an attempt offense. Attempted murder is contrary to section 204, a and B of the Penal Code Act, Cap 120, okay? Now, when you look at that offense, at the definition, uh, that offense was defined in the case of Uganda versus uh, Muwanga 
that is CS case number 456 of 2018. Now, the judge went on to define attempted murder as follows. Listen to the definition, very interesting. An aborted or failed attempt to murder. The judge went on to state that it consists of both actus reus and mens rea that for you to successfully get a conviction for attempted murder, you must prove both action, which is the actus reus, and intention. And remember, intention is one of the elements of mens rea. So in essence, even these attempt offenses or incoherent offenses that fall under the category of attempts, even actually require prosecution to prove both actus reus and mens rea. So this goes on to show you how the maxim is really at the heart of criminal law. For example, look at some of the ingredients of uh, attempted, uh, attempted murder. One, and, and again, these ingredients were laid down in the case of Uganda versus Mwanga. I already gave you the citation. Please look up the case. It's available online. Now, one of the ingredients of attempted murder is intention to cause death. Okay, and that is the mens rea. The second uh, element is an overt act manifesting that intention. And this is actually the actus reus of the offense. So again, this shows you that even for attempt offenses, you still need to prove actus reus and mens rea. Thirdly, let's now look at conspiracy offenses. Will conspiracy offenses also do the same? Okay. Find one of the offenses, but uh, which is uh, uh, a conspiracy offense, and make an analysis on it. State the law, lay out the ingredients, give a case, make an analytical discussion on it. Please, it's very important, don't just throw these, uh, these cases around, okay? Your essay should be written in a systematic, comprehensive, and in a way that it flows from the beginning to the end. There must be that flow okay of your essay it must connect itself very well if you don't create that flow then the examiner uh, will not be impressed and definitely you'll not be able to get a mark on impression and, and general organization so don't just throw um, these points around make sure that they are very organized and they are very specific now having made that discussion we are still in the border of the question proceed however and look at the exceptions to the maxim under criminal law because this maxim has exceptions and one of the exceptions is what we call strict liability offenses now with strict liability offenses first proceed to define them what are strict liability offenses strict liability offenses are in in in, in summary or basically these are offenses that actually do not require a mens rea for a successful a criminal conviction so, meaning that a person who commits a strict liability offense only needs to, 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 to have a guilty act. The mens rea must not be present. The moment you do something, even if your mind is innocent, you will be convicted for your actions. So, basically, for strict liability offenses, mens rea is not necessary. And then, secondly, actus reus uh, constitutes a complete offense without the mens rea. Ria. Now, I'll share with you an example of these offenses that you'll include in, in your essay question or when you're answering such an example, such, such, a, such a question. So, offense example number one, driving without a driving permit. That's an example of a strict liability offense. Section 35, subsection 1 of the Traffic Road and Safety Act of 1998 as amended by the 2020 Act. Please look at it. It provides for that offense, and it's an example of a strict liability offense. The ingredients of this offense, one, driving a vehicle on the road. All prosecution has to do is to prove that you are driving a vehicle on the road. That is an actus reus. Secondly, prosecution will also have to prove only that the accused had no driving license. Again, that is an actus reus. So you realize that there is no requirement to actually prove the guilty mind. It doesn't matter. Even if you are driving on the road to save life and you don't have a valid driving license, even if you are driving, rushing someone to the hospital and you don't have a driving license, the intention does not matter. Okay? Even if your mind is innocent, it does not matter. Provided you don't have a valid driving license, you're on the road, that is enough, okay, for you to be found criminally liable. Second, Example, offense number two, 
okay as an example possession of firearms without a firearms permit section 3 of the of the firearms amendment act of 2008 provides for that offense and the ingredients of that offense one the thing is a firearm all prosecution will have to do is to prove that the thing is a firearm secondly that the thing was in the accused possession we use the word thing meaning referring to a firearm but prosecution would have to prove that that thing is actually a gun then thirdly that the accused had no valid license so prosecution has to prove that you had no valid license to actually hold the firearm and just like that without proof of uh, of mens rea you'd be convicted for the offense so just the act of having a firearm without a valid um, license in itself is sufficient please i encourage you to look at uh, the case of muhammad ismail versus r it's a case of 1955 yaka that is uh, eaca page 461 okay which actually provides for those ingredients and discusses this offense in um, more detail uh, let's now proceed to look at another exception and that is what we call vicarious liability offenses so with vicarious liability offenses please proceed define the doctrine of vicarious liability and go on to give examples basically the doctrine of vicarious liability is basically to the effect that a person uh, will be held criminally liable for the actions committed by another especially their agent so assuming a person commits an offense and they are an agent to let's say principal the doctrine of vicarious liability makes the principal liable for actions of the agent now this is very interesting because as a general rule in criminal law uh, criminal offenses are personal in nature okay you cannot be charged for the offense of another person as a general rule but however for, for uh, under the doctrine of vicarious liability the principal can actually be held liable so you proceed now to give examples under ugandan law or under the statute that actually provides for vicarious offenses so i'll share with you about two examples example number one is the offense of uh, permitting a person to drive a vehicle without insurance or an unregistered vehicle or one without a prescribed number plate is an offense so, so any of those three okay is an offense authority please look at section 33 subsection 1 of the traffic roads safety act 1998 and the amendment of 2020 okay they actually provide for that offense the ingredients of this offense one prove that the purported owner is the registered owner of the car then the vicarious liability will arise so all you have to prove is that the person who uh, actually gave out uh, the car that does not have insurance or is uh, not a registered vehicle maybe it entered the country or illegally and it was never registered by ura or, or that the vehicle the person who gave it out uh, uh, that vehicle does not have a number plate but he still gave it out to another person to drive it so the moment you prove that that person who gave out the vehicle is actually the owner of the vehicle that is in itself is enough please look at those sections and also look at the case of wanika and another versus r it's a case of 1967 east africa page 279 let's now proceed uh, to actually look at uh, the last uh, the second last example example number two is importation of pharmaceuticals without a valid importation license authority look at section 44 subsection 1 please read it together with section 61 of the national drug policy and authority act cap 206 now under that statute directors and secretaries of companies or a firm partner will be held vicariously liable for actions committed by their agents or persons operating uh, under their supervision if they didn't do due diligence or if they were actually aware or connived with them so there is that vicarious liability okay number three example number three the offense of selling or supplying impure drugs okay please look at section 30 read it together with section 61 of the national drug policy and authority act cap 206 uh, that will also be authoritative so you're not allowed under the law to actually sell or supply drugs that are not pure 
or duplicate of fake drugs that do not actually work. It's an offense. And uh, of course, directors of companies, company secretaries, or even a partner to a law firm will be held vicariously liable for acts in selling such impure drugs committed by their agents. Or if it's a company, the workers that are working in that company, if they commit that offense, the directors and secretaries of firm partners will actually be held vicariously liable. So that is it that you'd actually include in your body. Then finally, you have to proceed and make a conclusion. Okay, you go on and conclude your question. Conclusions always carry marks. We always award marks for conclusions, about two to three marks. So it's very, very important for you to be able to make a very good conclusion. Unfortunately, most of the students always miss these two to three marks because you have to convince the lecturer by ensuring that your conclusion is vibrant analytical and critical conclusion. It's always very important to note that uh, the conclusion must be strong. It must always show your personal opinion and reflect the deep understanding of how you have been able to interpret the question and also to discuss it. Now, it's very, really important to note for purposes of this question that you need to pick a very good conclusion and uh, you put it forward and you'll be able to earn all the full marks. So you can pick on your conclusion on anything. For example, if I were you, I would pick, for example, on the aspect of the defenses to further my discussion that indeed the maxim or the principle that actus non facit reum, nisi men sit rea is sacrosanct to actually the criminal law system. And how would I pick on that? I would briefly say that um, uh, in conclusion, uh, the doctrine that actus non facit rim nisim and sit rea is further um, uh, indicated in the various defenses pertaining to criminal law, such as, you're going to give examples, uh, such as um, mistake of fact and the defense of insanity. When you look at the defense of insanity, it actually attempts to negative the mens rea of the accused person by actually attacking the aspect of the mind being guilty. And this argument is put forward that an accused person was actually not in their proper state of mind as to understand what they were doing, or that if they understood what they were doing, they didn't know that it was right. And as such, this defense, in essence, is in support of the maxim that actus non facit rum, nisi men sit rea. And furthermore, also the defense of mistake of fact also further supports that maxim because the defense of mistake of fact actually again targets the aspect of mens rea and it intends to say that an accused person did not understand the facts at the material time of committing the offense. And the authority for that position as pertains the defense of mistake of fact can clearly be found in the case of Republic versus Sultan Majinga. Please go and look at it, 1967, High Court Bullet, page 33. So basically, when you look at that case, it's really very interesting. And here, an accused person had actually gone to the garden. And uh, normally, he used to have uh, wild animals that would come and attack uh, his crops. So uh, he went there. And uh, when he went to the garden to check on his crops, he actually found that the grass was shaking. Okay, so the grass was shaking and he was very sure that these were the wild animals that actually normally eat his crops. So he charged his spear and then threw it aiming at the grass that was moving around. And unknown to him, he ended up uh, damaging and eventually killing a man and a woman who were actually in the bush having sexual intercourse. Of course, he was charged for the offense of murder. And when he reached court, he raised the defense of mistake of fact. And that defense succeeded. Why? Because court held that at the time that he threw the spear, he did not um, know, or rather he was mistaken as to the facts. He actually thought it, it is a wild animal, whereas actually these were two human beings. And furthermore, he actually first called out. He called out the names um, to see if that was actually a human being. There was no response. He kept on calling out who is there. There was no response. So court went on to say that all this indicated that actually the accused person was guilty. 
rather was innocent. So it goes on to indicate further that this defense okay, of mistake of fact targets to negative uh, or it targets to weaken or to show that actually there is no mens rea. And as such, all these defenses, and there are very many others that you can look out for, all these defenses are in support or they further the notion that the maxim actus non facit ruim nisi mens sit rea is actually sacrosanct and very important and at the heart of the criminal law justice system. So you can conclude in such a manner, okay? So you can come up with any conclusion of your own and then you build it up authoritatively and it should reflect your body and the argument in your essay. Okay, so you can, go on, you can go on to analyze and look at other defenses. I just gave you two examples. But please note that your conclusion should not be as long as mine. I only added in the aspect of analysis just to also uh, show you uh, the importance and relevance of that maxim to the heart of criminal law. But of course, if you're writing your conclusion, ensure that you keep it short. It shouldn't be long. It should be short but analytical and comprehensive. It should be, it, it should be mature and strong. It should indicate um, a law student that you are and it should also indicate that you have had a very good understanding of the subject. This is really, really very important. So basically that was all really for our question and uh, the various topics that we have uh, looked at today. Uh, please ensure that you subscribe to my channel just at the end of this video there is a, a button that you can click on which has letter C and you would have subscribed to my channel or you can um, also turn on your notification and in case you found this video helpful, please just give it a thumbs up, like it, share it with your colleagues so they are also able to benefit. And then once again, students interested in private law tutorial sessions, please reach out to us, we'll be able to help you. We have helped so many students in law school um, uh, to, to ensure that their grades are, imp are improved. So please contact us. Our numbers are down in the description box. In case of any questions or comments, please put them down and I'll be able to respond to them every time I have a minute. Uh, we meet in another class. Bye-bye. See you.